Good evening. I'm Joe Carroll Lauder, Chairman of FAPE, and I just want to welcome everyone here this evening. Thank you for being with us. <laughs> the U.S. mission to the United Nations is a very special place for many of us at FAPE. We spent a lot of time here in hard hats, curating this collection with the invaluable help of FAPE's brilliant fine arts advisor, Rob Storr, who also is the dean of the Yale Art School. We are so lucky to have him. We are delighted to have John Huntsman with us tonight. Charlie Rose should be here shortly, and we're all looking forward to their talk. And if Charlie doesn't show up, we'll look forward to John talking. <laughs> He's smart enough for all of us. <laughs> I want to especially thank John Studinsky and Bob Calicello, board members of FAPE, who helped work on this evening. They were just terrific and got all of you to come here. Thank you. And now it is my enormous pleasure to welcome Ambassador Isabel Coleman, U.S. Representative to the United Nations for UN Management and Reform. We're so pleased to be here tonight, and we thank you very much for your hospitality. Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the members of FAPE and to Chairman Joe Carroll Lauder. Thank you so much, and our other distinguished guests and, um, and colleagues here tonight. Ambassador Power, I know, is very sorry she cannot be here, and she asked me to welcome all of you and to convey her uh, sincere appreciation and, and thanks for all that FAPE has done for the U.S. mission. And I'm also happy to be joined here tonight by two of my colleagues, Ambassador David Pressman, who's someplace in the room, over here, and Ambassador David Dunn, who is back there. Thank you. Thank you so much. The U.S. mission to the U.N. is really honored to host this event tonight. Uh, as all of you know, FAPE is the public-private partnership dedicated uh, to providing permanent works of American art for U.S. embassies worldwide. For nearly 30 years, FAPE has contributed to the State Department's mission of cultural diplomacy by partnering with American artists whose works encourage cross-cultural understanding. Today, it supports the art installations of more than 200 artists in over 140 countries around the world, representing the very best of American vision, dynamism, and culture. And many of the artists whose works are in display, or several, I should say, of the artists whose works are in display here at the U.S. Mission and in embassies around the world are, are here tonight, and it's, it's a tremendous honor for, for us to have you here with us, so thank you. I've had the pleasure of viewing FAPE-supported artwork in many of our embassies, from Kabul to Tokyo to Abu Dhabi, but of course I'm partial to the artwork that's here at the U.S. Mission, where we have over 200 pieces of artwork on display by more than 50 American artists. I'm the lucky beneficiary of having a Roy Lichtenstein print in my office, and just about every day I appreciate the calming influence of the lovely Anna Valentina tapestry in our lobby. Here in the rotunda, it's hard not to be moved by the strong simplicity of Saul Lewitt's wall drawing number 832, the red spiral line on blue, which is right above us. It's very dramatic, and I can tell you I've had meetings here where I have to say to people, come on, back here, attention, because they're all looking up. So, On behalf of all my colleagues at the United States Mission, let me express our sincere thanks to Chairman Lauder, and the other members and officers of FAPE for the great work that you do. Your work here and across the globe reminds us of the important role that art and culture can play 
in fostering mutual respect and understanding between nations. Thank you again for all of your assistance and dedication to cultural uh, interchange. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to speak a little bit, not too long, um, and first of all, underscore all of the uh, extensions of gratitude that have been made so far, uh, as Joe Carroll and Eden Rafshun and uh, all the people who are principally involved in this organization know uh, this is a labor of love. It is done by people with their very scarce free time, uh, and it is done very collectively. And uh, we try to do it in a way that will benefit uh, the people who work in this building, the people who come to this building, or buildings like it elsewhere all around the world. Um, as a dear friend of mine and friend of Joe Carroll's and of many of you, uh, Brian Urquhart, who is the former Undersecretary General of the UN for Peacekeeping, said, you know, the art of the buildings in the UN are a sort of running history of modern art, contemporary art, and we try to keep that moving so that as people think about the future and think about the past, they also have something sort of present in front of them that speaks to a whole series of different thoughts, conditions, concerns, and uh, that is something that they can think and look about when they're not discussing politics, economics, military relationships, etc., 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 um, I'd like to uh, say that we are very grateful that John Huntsman, Ambassador Huntsman, and Charlie Rose will be here to do this conversation for you. Uh, and we are also grateful for many of the artists who have come to this event. Uh, and Ambassador Coleman saved me having to speak about the Soloit, but there are other things here that people should notice. There's Linda Benglis's piece, which is over across the way, and there is right behind me the work of Ron Gorchoff, who is actually here. I don't know if Linda is or not, but if either one of them or both of them are here, could they stand up? Now, I am the chairman of the professional uh, council or committee for uh, FAPE, which is the committee that thinks about what we might do, uh, sends out fingers, feelers, overtures, very diplomatic, um, and tries to see what people are willing to do with and for us. Uh, and Peter Galassi, who's right here, uh, who has just done a marvelous exhibition in town, is a member of that committee. Uh, he's principally concerned with photography, although he's actually a specialist in French 19th century landscape painting. You wouldn't know it, but it's true. Um, so, uh, And one of the things that's happened is that FAPE has expanded its horizons. As you know, we do commissions uh, with embassies of art of virtually all media, uh, but we also run two series, and there's the Lee Quinchy, uh, Kimchi McGrath print series, which keeps being added on to, and Jeff Coons, who I believe is here, is contributing a, a print for this next year, as is Sylvia Mangold, who unfortunately is not here, um, but also we've expanded it to include photography, and so we will have photographic material, and uh, right here is some Tina Barney, I'm having little senior moments that happens when you get to my age. Um, so Tina Barney and others in the room. Uh, to have in all kinds of embassies scattered some of the same images so that if people come to different embassies, they will find some of the same images as well as the unique things that are done for us in various far-flung places. Um, I think Sophia Lewitt is also here, so if she's... Uh, uh, willing to stand up, that would be great. Uh, uh, Saul was a great supporter of this program, as has uh, his widow, Carol LeWitt, uh, and has not only done this, but a great project in Berlin. Now, among other people here who have also contributed mightily is Jack Shearer, who's a member of the committee. Uh, his partner, Elizabeth Kelly, has contributed work to the Berlin Embassy, uh, to uh, China. You will see right up there on the wall are two photographs, one red and yellow, one red, white, and blue, which are works that, uh, Saul, uh, to, that Elizabeth Kelly has donated to the embassy newly opened in Guangzhou. Uh, excuse me, in Beijing, sorry, we also have in Guangzhou, I'll get to that in a minute, uh, in Beijing, which was uh, designed by Craig Hartman, uh, and where there are many other projects, including projects by Martin Purrier, which is right there in the middle, uh, and also by Louise Bourgeois and others. Um, uh, there uh, is on the wall now, Guangzhou, I get to it, which is right there, that is Joel Shapiro, and Joel Shapiro has been a major donor as well, because he did our first project, which was in Ottawa. 
So if you think about this, these are artists who have given not once but twice, three times, over and over and over again. Ellsworth, for example, has also given prints that are in this building. Uh, and this building is hung with works of art on, I think, 19 floors. Uh, unfortunately, some of the floors are top secret. You can't see them. But the people who work on those floors can see it all. Um, in any case, uh, there are artists who have given over and over and over, and they get no benefit. There is no tax benefit. As you know, tax laws in this country don't give artists benefit for giving things to institutions. So they just give it to the country, right? And then there are many people at this room who have given things from their collection to these uh, uh, to these uh, various and sundry projects around the world. Uh, one other thing I should mention, by the way, is that blue sculpture, which is in Kwang Zhou, is uh, also downstairs on the second floor. And actually, uh, uh, Joel very spontaneously realized when I said, there's a little space there that I was hinting that the little space should have something. And so he, did, he brought us the model for that, the maquette for that. Um, as I say, these are buildings all over the world. We have, as, we have, as I said, in Beijing, we have this uh, major project in Guangzhou, but we have others as well. Uh, and I will just give you some of the artists who I think are in the room, uh, and I hope that I don't miss anybody. Tina, as I said, Tina Barney, who's right here, is in the photography collection. Linda Banglis, who is, I think, here, is there, but she's also in Mumbai. Uh, Don Gummer, who is right over there. <laughs> and Don Gummer is now in the process of working on the final preparations for an enormous sculpture in the Moscow Embassy. Uh, and as you can imagine, going to Moscow to do that right now will be a very interesting experience. Um, but in any case, it's, it's, a, really, it's a really fantastic uh, piece, and it's, it's one of the most uh, newly conceived and uh, soon to be newly realized ones. Uh, uh, by the way, as, as far as Russians are concerned, Emilia and Ilya Kabakov, who are both exiled Russians, uh, who have come, become naturalized American citizens, have work downstairs. So we have international artists who are, as this country is, a country of immigrants, people who have come here, settled here, become citizens, and then give back. Uh, I mentioned uh, Jeff Koons. Julian Lethbridge is in the lobby downstairs, and Julian is, I think, somewhere around. I last I saw him, he was over there. It's a beautiful, it's a beautiful uh, painting in, in, in soft brown tones, uh, which is near the Calder, and I know this because I was involved in installing it. Um, Dorothy Lichtenstein, I believe, is here, and Dorothy and Roy, her late husband, both were extremely generous. And I remember a dinner at... And I remember a dinner at the White House in, uh, during the um, Clinton years when Dorothy presented a painting of Roy's. And again, this is, this is something that is enormous. And if you know what Roy Lichtenstein's paintings are now worth, this is a great act of generosity. Uh, Maya Lin, who's not here tonight, has done work in Istanbul, and she, of course, did the Vietnam Memorial in Washington, which is separate. Helen Marden is here, and uh, Bryce Marden has uh, also contributed to our print project. Uh, uh, let's see who else. Uh, Donald Odili Odita, who is Nigerian, Nigerian American, did the lobby downstairs. Uh, Ellen Phelan, who is in this building and also uh, soon to be in Berlin, is here. <laughs> Dorothea Rockburn, who's recently completed a project in Jamaica dedicated to Colin Powell, is here. Clifford Ross, who is an innovator in all kinds of ways in photography uh, and who is doing a whole series of projects where he's changing the rules of what can be done with photographs, ha has two vast photographs downstairs in the conference area where they do the press conferences. Um, Julian Schnabel, I think, is here tonight. and has given to the Gift to the Nation, which is the, the, the name of the collection of works that has been given. Uh, Frank Stella, I think, is here tonight, and he contributed. Um, contributed uh, the first artist to contribute to the uh, Lee Kim Chi McGrath print collection. Joni Weil of GEM Gemini and her husband uh, have done an uh, uh, enormous amount um, to make it possible for artists to make prints, so they have donated their materials and their printmaking capacities uh, to the whole collection, and it's been fantastic.
And her husband's name is Sid Felson. I just caught it. It's, it's, I'm, I'm a little nervous here. Uh, and then Ellen Phelan, uh, who has done a piece in Dar es Salaam at a rebuilt embassy after an incident which brought it down, the first one. Uh, now, this gives you some sense. These are, these are buildings in very high-pressure areas. Uh, there are lots of new buildings being built. Uh, there are lots of projects in all parts of the world. And for these artists, as I say, to do it once, twice, thrice is amazing. We are also always adding on new artists, younger artists, artists of different backgrounds, and so on. So the idea is to create as broad and as wide a range of art as possible so that when people come to see these embassies, they will see that American culture truly is marbled, mosaic-like, very various, and that's what makes it vital. Uh, nobody who makes projects for this thing has, uh, for this project, has to say anything specific. Uh, we have no rules about the content or anything like that, but the aggregate of it says something about the kind of country this is, and that is, I think, why we all do it. So I would like to thank you. I'd like to thank all the people who were involved, uh, and uh, I will leave you to dinner and the next great event. Thank you. Happy to be here. I, I admire. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, it, it's, it's been one sort of incredible, this, and this tops it off. Um, last night I did a 60 Minutes piece with Larry David, and then the morning show this morning, and then I interviewed for my show tonight uh, James Clapper, the director of national intelligence, and then I went over and anchored the evening news this evening, and then I get here to sort of the creme de la creme, a conversation with John Huntsman. Uh, but... I so much believe in, in what the organization does and, and my love for art and my love of the idea of people having access to it around the world uh, is such a valuable cause. And to be here uh, at the, this mission and, um, is a great honor for me. And especially to uh, have a conversation uh, with John Huntsman about China, where he served as ambassador, speaks the language, uh, has served in the State Department uh, as... Uh, in, in a num number of different posts, was a very successful governor of his state, um, ran for president, as many of you know. Do we have to talk about that? <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and, but they tell me that the only thing that will cure presidential ambition after you've had it is like an embalmer's fluid. <laughs> that's, that's a Either famous that quote or, from Mo Udall. Or that, that scotch whiskey they hide in the closets in Utah. <laughs> um, but I, I, I had an interesting conversation today with James Clapper about China and, and how we read them and how they read us. Um, so I, I want to begin a conversation that I will have with him and look forward to. And, and in fact, um, tomorrow night I have another conversation I did with Kevin Rudd, who's a former Australian uh, Prime Minister about China, which I did at the Asia Society, uh, we, you can never, I mean, what's going on there, over there, what's happening there in terms of, of, of the leadership, and, and John knows so much more about that than, than I do, is fascinating. And it's fascinating as you think about how this century will unfold and China's role. Uh, let me begin with that question. Uh, where do you see, tell us about Xi Jinping rather than I saying, where do you see? Tell us about him and what he has done in the short time that he's been the leader of this country. Well, let me tell you, Charlie, first of all, what a pleasure it is to be with you. Thank you for teeing me up as if I were someone of consequence, <laughs> as opposed to just some hick from Utah. Yeah, well. uh, uh, I feel a little bit like the protagonist from that great contribution to American culture, Wayne's World. Yes. Remember when Garth and Wayne yes. saw Alice Cooper and it was not worthy, not worthy. The great worthy. Mike Myers. Yeah, exactly, exactly right. But for, first, before we get into Xi Jinping, let me just say what an honor it is to be uh, in the presence of artists and people who are the very best at what they do and those who support them. Because I walked in and out of some of these buildings on the wall uh, over the years and ran one of them uh, during some difficult and tumultuous times. Uh, and it gives lift to the spirits of those within. I don't know any other way to put it. It inspires, it becomes the familiar when sometimes a relationship gets downright fraught. Mm. And it doesn't matter who's coming through the building, whether it's diplomats or business people or spies or dissidents, they all look at the art and it means something 
unique and special to them. And I just have to tell you, what goes on here is, is rather extraordinary. I look at Ellsworth Kelly's piece right here. Thank you. And the only challenge we had with that beautiful piece was many thought we were the French embassy. <laughs> yeah. And we get a lot of inquiries from the street. Uh, uh, Xi Jinping, you, you know, our, our, our minds are sort of taken away from China because of the riveting news coming out, out of the Middle East. Uh, but I, I have to tell you, the U.S.-China relationship remains the most important of the 21st century. And if you want to understand where uh, the relationship is going, it's helpful to understand Xi, Xi Jinping as a person. He'll be 62 years old in, in June. He's the son of Xi Jinping, who himself was a leader, a deputy prime minister under Mao. He was railroaded out during the Cultural Revolution, imprisoned. Xi's mother was imprisoned as well. Xi was sent out uh, to the rural parts of the country during the Cultural Revolution with a man named Wang Qishan, who today is a member of the Standing Committee of the Politburo, probably his closest advisor. So all of these... And the man who's heading up the corruption invasion. The man who's heading up the anti-corruption drive. So, So, and I mention all of this because... Uh, you know, we're a product of our upbringing, our experiences, our education, that which we've been exposed to. And she has been exposed to a lot of interesting things during the course of his 62 years. And I would say that for him, his goal is to ensure that China never reverts back to the days of chaos and tumult during 66 to 76 during the Cultural Revolution. That, that's, his, that's his touchstone in terms of China at, at its worst. Uh, and so he's navigating a course going forward that is recognizing a couple of things. First of all, he's got to do a better job than the guy whose place he took, a man named Hu Jintao, uh, who I worked with as ambassador, uh, who was uh, a lovely man. Uh, he had a large standing committee of the Politburo, numbering about nine. Uh, your standing committee is your board of directors. It's a very important group of men, always has been men, uh, and, uh, and who was never assertive as a leader so that it was always collective bargaining among the players within the standing committee. And he had some very powerful leaders within the standing committee such that he was diminished by, for example, the presence of Zhou Yong Kang, who was seat number nine, which was responsible for the Ministry of State Security and Public Security and the meanest SOB in the country uh, when I was living there. And interestingly enough, he's just been rounded up yeah. in this dragnet. And I look at the folks who are falling victim to the anti-corruption campaign. I said, nobody, I don't care how close to China and the analytical community you are or any amount of intel you've read over the years, nobody would have predicted that Zhou Yong Kong, at one point the most powerful man in the country, would have been dragnetted uh, as a result of the anti-corruption. And here he sits in Tianjin uh, under house arrest uh, he'll probably go through the party uh, uh, judiciary system. So they've got two tracks. Uh, you know, Bo Xi Lai, for example, went through the party uh, judiciary track. His wife went through the regular judiciary track. I suspect that Zhou Yong Kong will go through uh, Shuang Hui, which is the party judiciary, where you just disappear. And so, you're never so he has been consolidating power. Consolidating power for, for what purposes? Yes. He knows that the only... Uh, the only governing entity with any legitimacy is the party to which he has pledged allegiance. It's, what is the party? The the party is an organization of 80 million members today, scattered in uh, 3,500 outposts around the country. It is the only organizing body left in China that can get anything done. Uh, It's dead. It's broken. It's corrupt. It's rotting from within. It's lost the believability of the people and Consequently, there's a trust deficit, not unlike what we see in this country. The people don't believe the party anymore. So Xi Jinping gets to power. He'd been vice president for a while. Now he's two years into uh, his reign with three primary positions of power. He's president, which doesn't mean a darn thing in China. He's head of the Communist Party, which means everything. And he's chairman of the Central Military Commission, the CMC. Which Hu Jintao never had. Which Hu Jintao never had. He made it as far as vice chair. Uh, honorifically. But it was the generals who always controlled the CMC under Hu Jintao. 
Consequently, and because he'd never had any military exposure, uh, there were rogue operations being run in China that we tracked uh, that were very dangerous uh, and that nobody seemed to be responsible for. Navy uh, assets deployed and things going on that nobody could explain. It was a very dangerous set of circumstances. Uh, and in comes Xi Jinping, whose dad was a military guy, a Long March veteran, who he, he himself worked as a special assistant to a man named Gung Biao, who was the Minister of Defense uh, between 1979 and 1981, when they got their fannies kicked by the Vietnamese in that very short war. So he has the stripes on his shoulder to prove that he's a military guy. So he's consolidated power, uh, military, party, and princelings. And I say princelings because if you want to run China effectively today, you've got to have the support of the party, you've got to have the support of the military, the PLA, the largest standing army still in the world, and you've got to have the support of the princelings, the sons and daughters and the grandsons and granddaughters of the revolution. But that's where some of the corruption has been. All throughout. Therefore, the only person imaginable who can put an end to it is a princeling himself. Hu Jintao could never stand up to the princelings. He could never make any inroads in terms of taming the state-owned enterprises, of which there are maybe 110 big ones, five mega, mega big ones. And uh, so the, the task for Xi is to say, okay, I'm, I'm in office for two terms. I've got now you know, between the 18th Party Congress, which put him into office two years ago, to the 19th Party Congress, which will be 2017, my first order is to consolidate power. Because unless I have a powerful base, I can't get anything else done. From the 19th Party Congress to the 20th Party Congress going out to 2022, my task then will be, with a consolidated power base, to execute on my reforms. So we're hearing a lot about reforms. They're not doing them. Why? Because he doesn't have a consolidated power base yet, so he's not ready to launch. But he's been leaking them out in the, in the plenums, like the third plenum of last year and the fourth plenum of this last November. So you get little hints of what he wants to do from an economic reform standpoint, from a rule of law standpoint. And I'm convinced that after the 19th Party Congress, he will spend his last term driving home some of these reform elements because he knows he has no choice. Uh, and what will they do about pollution? This is a biggie. Uh, you know, for those of you who have been to Beijing, and I know many of you have, uh, it's a horrible situation. So we had on the top of the embassy, right kind of close to where the French flag was put on the side of the building, we had, we had along, along with some other fancy gadgetry, uh, uh, an EPA air quality monitor. And every day we take the air quality levels and we tweet them out. And they were horrific. I mean, if you have maybe a 50 on a, on a PM 2.5 level in this country, uh, you're, you're, you're in bad shape. So governing Utah, we had some of the worst air quality in the country in the Wasatch Valley because it's, uh, it's sort of a unique geographic uh, uh, metropolitan area ringed by mountains trapping the air in. So I know something about bad air and how people respond to that. Uh, so we take the measure of the air quality, tweet it out, the ambassador to get called into the foreign ministry and dress down. You don't understand the numbers. Your readings are incorrect. You're out there by the fifth ring road in Beijing, and you're getting a lot of tailpipe emissions that don't count. Uh, well, what are they doing now in Beijing? They're actually reading, following, and respecting EPA standards for air quality. So it's interesting to see how they've gone from uh, criticizing now to embracing uh, the standards that we use here in the United States. As you know, uh, Bob Zalek coined a famous term of whether China wanted to be a stakeholder uh, in the world and whether it wanted to participate in a significant way. You clearly have the impression uh, that Xi Jinping wants the world to respect China and to recognize China for the power that it is. Beyond that, what does he want to do with the power that China has in terms of expansion in terms of the United States, in terms of what role China plays. We all in this room know, you know that they have some sense that um, over the long term, the dollar not necessarily ought to be the reserve currency. They have some concern about changing international institutions like the United Nations. Um, what do they want? What does he want? I, I would say it's, it's fair to conclude that when she shows up for work every day in Zhongnanhai, their White House, 
that he's thinking, I have to have two things working for me to get anything done in terms of the longer-term strategic plans. One, I need domestic tranquility. I have to make sure that my people aren't against me. Right. Now, that's not a sure bet ever in China. So why is it that they're spending more on the Ministry of State Security and the Ministry of Public Security than they are on the Ministry of Defense? Where do they perceive their threat to be? Internal. It's internal. Right. And most people don't understand that when they look at China. So you're saying that explains their paranoia about everything. Oh, that Human ex- rights, uh, no, you, religious so groups. Why is it that five, more than five people will never gather on a street corner without, without the, the Wu Jing, the, the domestic police taking them out? It's just the way they are. Uh, tremendous paranoia. Uh, so that's issue number one. Issue number two is he has to pray for a tranquil external, a benign external environment for China to grow. So he wakes up every morning and he says, geez, the Americans got it really well. <clears throat> they've, got, <clears throat> they've got the Atlantic Ocean and the Pacific Ocean as their great barriers, the most impenetrable borders of all. And they're not going to go to war with Canada anytime soon. It's kind of like, you know, being governor of Utah. You know, I never once had to declare war on Idaho, although I, I tried against Nevada a couple of times. And, you know, Mexico is kind of a challenging relationship sometimes. By and large, it's an opportunistic relationship for us. And then you look at China, surrounded by 15 nation states, some of whom they've been at war with in recent years in very unpleasant uh, circumstances. The Soviet Union along the Amur River, <clears throat> India 1962, Vietnam 1979, Korea Taiwan, just to name a few. And so he says, my external environment is potentially extremely hostile. I've got to manage that. So he's totally consumed with the domestic situation and the external situation. And then long term, if you want to understand China's foreign policy, I've come to find, <clears throat> pull out the old maps from the end of the Qing dynasty. So the Qing dynasty ended 1911 uh, with the rise of the Republic of China under Sun Yat-sen. And look at their territorial claims. And you'll find that uh, they had a vast region that was theirs. And they claim that that's kind of when the world stopped and all of that land is still theirs. Sovereignty matters to China. And their goal over time will be to bring all of the lost territories back into the fold. And that includes Taiwan, Hong Kong, of course, 1997, reverted back, Macau, 1999. You've got Tibet and Xinjiang, Uh, Inner Mongolia is already theirs. Outer Mongolia they've given up on. Uh, And then the islands of the East China Sea, the the Diaoyu Senkaku Islands, and the islands of the South China Sea, of which there are about 200. And they have about five claimants. So you you look around the map, and they're going to be busy focused on reclaiming their territory. And how far will they go to get the islands back? Never to the point where there will be an outbreak of, of kinetic hostilities. For one simple reason, they can't afford the blowback economically because if the economy collapses or if there's any threat that unemployment will go up and the economic indicators go south, uh, they'll have domestic turmoil, which will be the the end of modern China. So he can't afford to allow that kind of situation to play out. So it's interesting. You watch the hostilities with Japan, and I watched this the last couple. I've watched it for years. I've seen these cycles play out over and over again. And when the, the newspapers would be shouting out, you know, China, Japan on the brink of war, I'd say, ah, I'm not so sure about that. Let's let it play out for another year uh, because things will eventually diminish and uh, they will try to exert greater diplomacy because both sides want to grow economically. What's happened to the Chinese economy? We know it's grown from double digits, uh, declined from double digits down to about 7.4% growth in GDP. Uh, some think it'll go below 7% in 2016, 17. Uh, how does that impact what China believes uh, and, and what Xi Jinping wants to do? Uh, it'll be the largest economy in the world, yet its growth is slowing down. And it's trying to, in its reform, to shift from an export economy to a domestic demand. Economy. That's right. That's right. <clears throat> so they're, they're making one of the most complicated and unprecedented transitions in the history of modern economics which is to go from 30, 35 years of an investment-led export machine from which they benefited enormously to a consumption machine in which there is the expansion of of industry domestically, where there uh, is more buying power and people are are able to go up the, uh, the, uh, the economic ladder in terms of real incomes. They're stuck in the middle income trap right now because they haven't 
changed or updated their model, and she knows that. And when you start looking at the liabilities longer term, I mean, if you just take out Social Security cost for China, because they don't have a Social Security system in place, they want to get one, you get to 10 and $20 trillion real, real fast. So just, you know, start with the basics. We've, we've got, we need health care. We need infrastructure. We need, we need social safety net issues to keep everybody pretty much feeling good about their existence in the Middle Kingdom. And all of that is going to come at a great cost. And then you look at the demographics, which are upside down right now. So it's kind of an upside down pyramid. You've got, you know, four grandparents. You've got two parents. You have one child. Right. Now, I'm, I'm the recipient of the one child policy because my daughter is from China. And she was abandoned largely because of the one, chi- uh, one child policy. So how is that one child uh, going to be able to uh, play a role such that there's enough cash flow and income to deal with all of the financial burdens that the aging population is going to uh, cause for them? So it's no wonder more people are leaving the marketplace than going into the marketplace. Costs are going up. People are looking for alternative manufacturing platforms. And they've got a huge problem in terms of where they sit economically today. Uh, is all this happened in Asia, spe- specifically with China and, and with India now, which is looking at an economic future that looks better than it has for a while under the leadership of Modi? Uh, do we have something to fear from all of this? Uh, should we worry about China? Well, it depends if we want to be a confident people uh, or, or not. You know, the one thing you've noticed about this country, and this isn't a political con, I'm not running for office or anything. I've tried that before. Uh, What you see from 10,000 miles away, just because I've lived in Asia four times during my career, is you see this country, its level of confidence goes up and down. And we've just had a period in recent years where our mojo has kind of been low. And it's like we're, we're afraid of the world for some reason, as opposed to stepping up and acting responsibly, as we always have. Uh, and I, I, have, I have no concerns about this country competing against China longer term. Uh, we have what they want, and eventually they're going to have to look more like the United States, not cross the board. It's not, it's not the James Fallows argument. They're going to have to look more like us in terms of rule of law, predictability, rules of the road, a steady, reliable private sector that is generating new ideas, entrepreneurship, and protection of those ideas. But, I mean, people tell me that they're, they are changing their bias towards state capitalism, you know, that they're trying to create a more equal playing field between their private companies and their state-supported companies. Is that true? This is hard. This is exactly right. The only way they're going to break loose, remember the second-term objective uh, we talked about earlier between the 19th and 20th Party Congress, the only way you're going to make any headway there is, first of all, taking on the state-owned enterprises. They're behemoths. And they get preferred costs of capital, they get discounted raw material prices, and they're bastions of princeling privileges. A lot of sweetheart deals that are cut with the, the state on enterprise. So the only way you're going to get the economy moving in the right direction is by breaking down the state-owned enterprises and getting them to respect uh, a new set of rules. That's going to be really hard. But she has already started the process. And I'm convinced that the next wave under the anti-corruption campaign, because he's only gone after retired senior cadre like Xu Tsai Ho, General Xu Tsai Ho and Zhou Kang, and uh, Ling Jihua, for example, who I think will be nailed. I think the next round will be leaders of state-owned enterprises and currently serving senior people. I'm guessing that over the next year or two, we're going we're gonna to read some headlines that are going to shock even more than we have been shocked by the big names that have already been outed. Okay, I, I want to take some questions from this audience. So I think we have microphones or not, or, or, or we believe we can hear you, but they asked me to have a conversation and then to take your question. So just raise your hand. Uh, we can talk about anything. Yes, at the back of the room. And we have a microphone. Thank you, Charlie. Uh, Scotty Greenwood with FAPE. Thank you, Ambassador. Ambassador, today in Washington, the Congress is talking about the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Some people would say that it's actually an alliance to form uh, a bloc against China. I wonder if you could talk about free trade generally and the TPP specifically. So the the TPP arrangement, uh, I think, is a a good idea. Uh, It will include 
12 countries total, representing, I don't know, 40 percent of the world's GDP. It's a big deal. It's, so as a former trade negotiator, uh, so I, I was responsible for the Singapore Free Trade Agreement and the Australia Free Trade Agreement, started Korea, did uh, the ASEAN TIFA, the India TIFA, West Africa TIFA, back when I was Bob Zellick's deputy. And uh, these are really hard deals to do. I can tell you, having sat at the negotiating, really tough to do. So you've got 12 countries coming together. They're around, I don't know, around 25 or 30. And I've talked to Mike Froman, the U.S. trade negotiator, about this recently. They're making pr pretty good progress. They're well ahead of the deal with Europe, TTIP. And I'm not sure where that one goes ultimately. So this is moving along, I think, with trade promotion authority, which may actually happen in Congress, which you need to have before you'll get final offers from these countries. Because they'll dicker and they'll kind of nickel and dime you until you have negotiating authority from Congress, and then they'll put the best offers on the table. I've seen that work before. We don't have trade promotion authority. I think we will, maybe by summer, and that'll be a really big deal in terms of closing out some of these, some of these open arrangements. And then we'll be left with China doing their own version of, uh, of a transatlantic framework. So they've got all of their FTA, their free trade agreement countries, plus about four additional countries that they've brought into this new arrangement to kind of counterbalance what we are doing. So welcome to the reality of the U.S.-China relationship. For everything the U.S. does, China will do something in response to prove that there is great harmony in the sky. Mm. That's, you know, we'd hit them with a trade deal valued at $1.5 billion in punitive damages. They'd hit us the next day on something frivolous, though it might have been, $1.5 billion in damages. We do a trade deal, they do a trade deal. My concern is that at some point, uh, it's going to be counterproductive to have two different trade arrangements in the region that are being negotiated at different levels of quality. Some of them including intellectual property rights, some of them including trade facilitation, some of them including financial services, and others not. So we'd be really smart if we were to put the bilateral investment treaty on the table, which I think they're beginning to talk about now, as a first step with China. And to incentivize them by saying, I know your economy's here and ours is here, but let's get the bit done, the bilateral, because there's no, bi there's no investment treaty between the U.S. and China, amazingly enough. Let's start with that, and if we can begin to harmonize some of our standards around investment, we're going to work toward integrating these two large, uh, very important investment blocks. And I think that could keep us busy for the next five or ten years in a most productive way. And it actually, you know, it'd be a good strategy for the United States because we don't have much of a strategy in the world today. That'd be a darn good strategy with China and the Asia-Pacific region right. if we could pull that off. Let me go out here. And, and Ambassador, I'm going to ask you to speak if you don't mind. Uh, but right here, yes. Yes, thank you. Um, I wonder, uh, you said their main concern now is internal and gathering the islands and territories around them. How do you explain that they are investing so heavily in South America, particularly in Brazil. They invest more in Brazil today in the last few years than we do. How, how does that reconcile with your previous statement? They're, they're opportunistic and they're transactional. And I say that somewhat admiringly. Uh, they say, where's the United States in the world? And we want to go up toe to toe because we want to prove that we can compete too. So why are they in Africa? And to a lesser extent, why are they in Latin America? Let me tell you why they're in Africa. One, they're trying to round up through dollar diplomacy. You say a billion dollars here and a billion dollars there will go a long way in diplomacy in a lot of regions of the world. They want 50 votes in the United Nations right here in this neighborhood. And they figure if they engage with sub-Saharan Africa and if they trade and build roads and do all the stuff the United States isn't necessarily capable of today, they're going to win some friends and some support in the United Nations. Number two, uh, Chinese nationals are moving to other parts of the world, if you hadn't noticed. And they're trying to create new opportunities for Chinese enterprise abroad. Number three, uh, they're totally reliant, the Chinese, on critical raw materials around the world. And they want to make sure that they have long-term supply agreements that will never disrupt their ability to keep their economic base alive and well and competitive. And many of those raw material plays 
uh, or not surprisingly, in places like you described and in sub-Saharan Africa. So I suspect we're going to see a lot more of this. And then we're going to see, and this will surprise a lot of observers, their, their naval assets, their maritime capabilities will begin to follow the trade links because they want to do exactly what the United States does. They're, they're totally envious of our ability to protect our trade routes anywhere in the world, to deploy heavy military assets within 24 hours to any corner of the world, something they can't do. They have spent a lot of money modernizing their military. To what end? So they spend probably 110, 120 billion per year, uh, as against our 500 plus billion per year. Uh, our, our largest expense at DOD is, so I have, I have two boys in the Navy. I, I, I learned this stuff <laughs> through, through them. Uh, do the two boys in the Navy come to find that the largest expense now in our defense budget is health care? Health care and, uh, and costs for, uh, for the troops. Uh, theirs are maritime capabilities, specifically their submarine capacity. Uh, they're building really good submarines that are sophisticated. Uh, they're not buying the old stuff from the Russians anymore. And they've spent a lot of money on their missile technology. So their, 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 uh, their ballistic, intercontinental ballistic missile technology is good. Uh, road mobile missiles, uh, submarine launch ballistic missiles, uh, they're quite good at it. Uh, a whole lot better than they were in the early days. So that's where a lot of their spending has gone. And I'd have to say they're, they're entering the first tier of countries in terms of their capabilities in that regard. Okay. Yes. You know, it's, uh, it's, a com- it's a complex issue for them because as much as they want to compete in the marketplace and create global winners, not just in China, which they're doing with reckless abandon, uh, with indigenous innovation uh, and growing their own winner, they want to compete globally. But at the same time, I-, I think Xi Jinping wants to create a unique economic model that is uniquely his that is different and distinct from the free model U.S. system, different rules of the road, a different governing model. And it'll be interesting to see by 2022, because I think we're still in the laboratory for the next few years to see what comes out of China. But I think we're going to see a slightly different economic model that comes out of China, and one that he will hold up as the Chinese example. And what will that model look like? Well, it will be state heavy. Mm -hmm. So if, if you want to get a sense of where I think China will be, my own guess, having lived in both China and Singapore, uh, both in private enterprise as a diplomat, there was a reason Deng Xiaoping went to Singapore back in the 80s and said, this is our model. Right. And nobody really paid much attention to it. Well, what did Singapore have? State-linked corporations, uh, a dominant political party, the, the People's Action Party that Lee Kuan Yew founded in 1959, you know, still today, you know, in a, legis- in a parliament of maybe 75 seats, has 73 of them. I, I've done more interviews with Lee, with, with Lee Kuan Yew than anybody. And he told me that th- th- this amazing story about how Deng Xiaoping was enamored of what he had done in Singapore when he first came to power. And he sent like a thousand Chinese to Singapore and said, you study everything there, and you come back, and you tell me what we need to do in China. I invited them to Salt Lake City, but they didn't come. (laughs) Uh, Ambassador, talk about Europe and how Europe sees China and and, uh, and Germany, which is an exporting nation, uh, and, and in part depend on demand from China and around the world. Thank you, Charlie. John, it's an honor to be with you. Thanks, and Phil. We're humbled and honored to be with the FAPE community tonight. I served, I'm Philip Murphy. I served as our ambassador to the Federal Republic of Germany and co terminus with John's time in Be- Beijing. Um, Angela Merkel has invested an enormous amount in the relationship with China, and it's been in, more often than not commercially led. Uh, and the Germans do that really well. So they've got an extraordinary sort of commercial machine from their foreign ministry, from their other various organs, and they treat the Chinese relationship um, with with uh, enormous care. And as I say, a, a first and foremost, I think John w- would agree with a commercial bias mm-hmm. 
first and foremost. It is. It won't be a surprise to anyone in this room that she's been rather preoccupied with her backyard over yeah, the past several years. Right. So between the euro, which sort of is the gift that keeps on giving in terms of the crisis, um, Ukraine more recently, um, in which she's enormously invested, uh, I, I, it's fair to say over the past several years she's been much more focused on her on her backyard, and uh, she's got her hands full there. But there's no doubt that uh, the relationship with China is commercial first and is, is a, a paramount relationship for the Germans. Mm-hmm. But what's the nature of the commercial relationship? Well, you, I mean, we've, nor- seen this, we've seen this uh, decline in China's uh, GDP growth, and we've seen you know, their reform plan, which is to create more domestic demand than foreign demand and move from an export economy. You know, how does that affect Europe, for example? You know, Europe is looking at flat zero. A 1% growth in Europe would be cause for a national holiday. So if we're talking about 7.4 to 6.9% diminution in growth, they're still dancing in the streets. And and Germany in particular is an economy that uh, that a a big chunk of which is still manufacturing-based. So the car companies that we all know, all of the related webs to those car companies – this is a big manufacturing economy still. So there's an enormous amount of scope, again, led by the car companies to do business, but not limited to the car companies, financial services, banks, insurance, uh, widgets of all sort. There's a lot of upside, and I, I would give the Germans very high marks for taking advantage of that. Right. Mm-hmm. Mr. Thank you. Pleasure to have Thank you. Thank you. Uh, anyone else here? Because Yes. Yes, Ambassador. Uh, just one quick question. Um, A few months ago, there was a historic deal done between President Putin and the Chinese on a very long-term gas contract. And I wonder to what extent that is uh, foreboding of the future. And given the pressures that are on President Putin with Ukraine and the various sanctions, what are your views on that relationship and how it affects the West? Well, I was always reminded of the Sino-Russian relationship when I would drive uh, to see a leader in the Great Hall of the People, right by Tiananmen Square. I don't know if, I'm sure some of you have seen it. It's a great old edifice that was built on the 10th anniversary of the Sino-Russian relationship, so 1959. And Stalin-esque all the way to the roof, and they got there about 1961, when all hell was breaking loose with uh, the beginning of... Uh, the great leap forward, when Mao was taking his own road. And the Russians were so incensed, they left the country without a roof on the building. And the Chinese built then a Chinese roof on top of a Stalinesque architected building. And whenever I drive by that great behemoth of a building, I think, this is so emblematic of the Sino-Russian relationship. It's on and then it's off. They love each other, and then they're on the, the brink of nuclear war, as they were in autumn of 1964. So what brings them together now? Energy, the United States. Two leaders who think they're pretty special and see a little bit of each other in, uh, uh, across the border. Uh, now, she would think that Putin is a bit of a wild man. She's a, a lot more reserved. He's tranquil. He's, uh, he's predictable. Uh, not so Putin. So what I think you'll find in that relationship is, uh, is probably transactional value, as in the half-trillion-dollar energy deal that, uh, that they struck. I looked at some of the economics uh, and, and didn't find that it was terribly preferential for the Chinese. So it's a transactional deal. Uh, and I think they'll probably come together in uh, poking the United States in the eye occasionally. But here's where it gets really tough. When you look at Crimea and when you look at Ukraine, when China's centerpiece for its foreign policy is non-intervention in third countries, and when you've got Taiwan hanging out there that is still unresolved, and you take a, you take a Crimea, and then you want to have, uh, and then you want to have people who want to run a plebiscite or a vote for independence, this gives them a huge headache, and they say, we don't know that guy. We don't know Putin. Uh, and so for them, it's full of all kinds of tricky aspects. So they'll take the good ones on the transactional side. On the political level, they'll, I think, increasingly shy away from oh, it. Here and then here. Go ahead and get a microphone here at this table as well. Um, I'm Vicki Sant from Washington, D.C., and I've just returned from San Francisco uh, where I saw an extraordinary art show. 
And my question has to do with the power of arts and human rights in China. This show is at Alcatraz <coughs> Island, which, as you all know, is a very famous prison. And it's by the artist Ai Weiwei. And it's about imprisonment and freedom. He's a prisoner in China. He cannot leave the country. But he has these extraordinary shows around the world that show the impact of imprisonment. Is this just um, an embarrassment for China, or do you think it'll have an impact? I was having a huge impact. Uh, Ai Weiwei, uh, who is in pretty desperate circumstances and has been for a while, uh, opened some doors in China that nobody else could open through art and individual expression. And he unleashed an enormous level of energy among a very creative population. So I wrote, I wrote when Ai Weiwei was named one of the top 100 le interesting people, Time Magazine does this, I wrote his, his paragraph. And so I had a chance while sitting in Beijing to reflect on him as he was doing his thing. And it was a reminder as well, when I would bring dissidents through the U.S. Embassy, who were lucky to be out of prison, and I didn't know if once they left the, the gates of that building, if they would be rounded up again, they would walk in as artists, many of them, and they would be inspired by what they saw. And it was the expression of art, first and foremost, the, and literature, that was um, the first manifestation of, of freedom for them. You can't, you can't gather politically. You can't write letters to the editor. You can't lobby your government. Uh, you can't gather as a special interest group, but you can paint. And you can do artwork, and you can write. And that's what many in China are doing as uh, a manifestation of their individuality and expression of freedom. And it's a wonderful thing to, to, to watch play out and mature, because it's a universal kind of language. You know, I would speak English. They would speak Chinese. They'd see, they'd see, we all see kind of the same thing in what was going on. So it's real. And I would say there are some art districts uh, developing around Beijing that are powerful, powerful expressions of where the country is going tomorrow. Um, we will take one last question uh, because we promised you you would be out by nine. Yes. My question is not really a question exactly. It's a follow-up to this because um, I've been to China. I've also been to Russia where things are very difficult for artists. And my question is partly how can the American embassies or diplomats work in ways that are supportive of local artists and of free speech people uh, that don't create new problems but that actually sort of if you will, build alliances with people within these countries that want to see the same thing, though they may in fact be part of the power structure itself. I was wandering through a, a neighborhood in Beijing where they have some new uh, art galleries on display, all very new. It's an old bomb factory that they closed down, and now it's kind of an art gallery. And I ran to a young woman. I saw her work that she was doing. It was all very expressive of uh, migrant women in China. And I was so touched by her work. I went in, and it wasn't very expensive stuff. And I bought several of them. And I put them on my walls at home in the embassy, where people would come in. And I invited her one time to showcase this, and invited some people of power in the country. And here was this lovely woman from nothing. She was from a small town called Shijiazhuang, which is in southern Hubei province. And she herself was a migrant worker. And so she could sort of encapsulate their journey in her art. And I'll be darned if it wasn't the most powerful thing that I did, one of the most powerful in my home with some of the power elite, this young artist who came from nothing, who through her artwork was able to explain her journey and the plight of a whole lot of people. You just take little examples like that. And I didn't think much of it at the time, but I've reflected back on it over and over again. And I thought, that's what envoys should be doing in part. That's, that's, part of the, that's part of expressing American values in ways that really are universal. You've come to the right place to say that. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. My, uh, thank you. My thanks to Ambassador John Huntsman. Thank you. Thanks, Charlie. Pleasure being with you. Thank you. I'm Bob Colicello. I'm, um, I'm a member of the FAPE board, and I'm also chairman of 
our new membership committee, which is called, uh, which has formed something called the FAPE Circle. Uh, I want to thank all of you be, for being here tonight, but in particular, uh, the new members of the FAPE Circle, um, many of whom are on the young side, which every organization needs. Uh, when Joe Carroll asked me to head up this thing, I said, why am I, who's just gone on Medicare, heading up the youth committee? But uh, I'm glad to see all of you here of all ages and generations. Um, we particularly want to thank uh, John Huntsman and Charlie Rose for this incredibly... <laughs> it's incredibly fascinating, illuminating conversation. Uh, I think uh, Ambassador Huntsman is, uh, well, I think he's a great American and a great leader. Um, but I'll leave my own political views aside. But I, I think you spoke so eloquently on why art is so important in our embassies, why American art um, presents a side of the United States that maybe is not so often seen. And uh, what this organization, I think, does very well is uh, remind people that America is not just about security uh, and our new embassies, many of which are fortress-like, um, you know, but America is also about creativity and free expression and individual expression. So uh, that's one reason I, for one, am very involved in, in FAPE. But I think everybody here uh, is here for that reason. Um, I want to thank uh, FAPE's uh, very special board member, John Straczynski, who had a lot to do, uh, to do with organizing this evening. Um, this is the inaugural event of the FAPE Circle, and I would like to recognize my Vice Chairman, Eleanor Aquavella, Stavros Niarkos, who is also on the FAPE Board, and Vito Schnabel. Uh, as well as the 23 members of uh, our membership committee, uh, almost all of whom are here tonight for making this evening a great success. And I'm grateful to the new circle members for turning out too in force. Um, tremendous thanks are due to Christ, or are, due, are owed to Christie's, our sponsor for this evening. Uh, they made the evening possible, and we are very grateful for your continued support of FAPE. Uh, the U.S. UN staff has been fantastic. Ambassador Power, your staff is spectacular, and I would like to recognize the following for their efforts. Tom Gallo, Carlos Figueroa, Euseline Obas, Leslie Garvin Ferguson, and Sergeant Haber. And lastly, I would, thank to the, uh, I would like to thank uh, the person who really does the most uh, and has for many, many years for this organization and has made it the great organization it is, which is our chairman, Joe Carroll Lauder. Thank you all. Enjoy dessert.